This video is sponsored by Describe. Earlier in the year, I made a video about the different methods for building combat encounters. But today we're actually going to put some of that advice into action and show the process I use when creating combat encounters for 5th edition games of D&D. Well, I say the process I use, but that's not really accurate. There are a lot of times these days when I'm working off of a module, so I don't need to generate the encounter whole cloth. I've also mainly been running Theater of the Mind games for the past few years, and for my next campaign I do plan to use maps again and use our virtual tabletop, probably Foundry VTT, so this video sort of shows me shaking the dust off and returning to the process of generating an encounter whole cloth and using a map. This is the idealized version. This is how I think about designing combat encounters when I take the time in advance. The topic for this video was voted on by my patrons. If you want to get in on those polls, you can support me on Patreon. If you support me at $15 a month, you'll get to vote on the monthly polls to pick the subject for future videos. If you can't afford that kind of support right now, that's totally okay. Uh, if you still want to join the Patreon, you'll get other perks at lower tiers as well. The support from Patreon really helps me make this my full-time job, which is just a dream come true for me. As for this video itself, I recorded it on Twitch. I try to go live on Twitch at least once a week, so if you'd like to hang out with me for future live streams, some of which become videos on this channel, I would love to have you. Both the link for Twitch and for Patreon are in the doobly-doo below. So without further ado, let's jump over to that live stream to watch me build some combat encounters. So go ahead and vote in the poll. Let's figure out who is going to be the, um, the final member of this party. So once again, for those who missed the intro, uh, we're going to build a combat encounter, so first we need to build our party. Because the first thing you need to know when you're building a combat encounter is who's going to be in the fight. So we have right now Hayden Winter, the human paladin who, if from he's from the episode where he thinks that he's a um, uh, member, uh, character in a storybook. We have Vilial Vinikin, who's an artificer. She has a little robot friend. We have Soroya, follower of the dawn, who is the fire genasi monk. Uh, we need one more character. And these are all characters that I referenced in my um, Steel Characters from my D&D Beyond um, episode. Hi, I mean, I, I really should have known who the winner was going to be, uh, and I kind of did. Uh, so our fourth character, it looks like, uh, with a 66% of the vote, is Felix the Fair, the Puppeteer Bard. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to level up these characters. So, a question for everyone, and just sound off in the chat, because this one's easy enough. Because the whole goal of this is to show you the process of building a um, encounter. And I think it's more useful to build an encounter at the levels people tend to actually play. So between third to maybe sixth is pretty common. Um, so let me know in the comments, what level should these characters be? Not in the comments, in the Twitch chat. Well, let me know, um, what character, what level should these characters be? Should they be third level, fourth level, fifth level, or sixth level? Alabear, you say the third is the most useful to most people. That seems to be the level most people have run or for or played as. Uh, Jory, you say third or fifth, since fifth is the first power spike level for a lot of classes. Uh, Starhound, you say people start at third all the time, so it'd be a good place to start less leveling for me. That's true. I, two of the characters are already level three. Uh, so we'll go ahead and level them up to three, and then maybe... We'll either do a sequel, or we'll just do it in this video if we have time. I'll level these characters up, and we'll see what adjustments would need to be made. Wait, what's defense? Which one's defense? No, 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 we want protection. Because I think that's more interesting for our purposes, because protection fighters uh, make it more of a challenge to deal with the other members of your party, because um, they can impose disadvantage on attacks against them. So that's something we'll have to factor in. So, as the GM, the first thing I'm going to do is just real quick familiarize myself with some of the most relevant things on their stat blocks. Which is useful for me as well, because I have created these characters, but I don't remember everything. So, Felix the Fair has Eldritch Blast, because he took the Spell Sniper feat. That's very useful for us to know, because Felix, his whole thing is that he's a puppeteer, right? He's got, like, either the sock puppets, or he's got marionettes, or whatever he's going to have, but he's always going to be looking for cover. So there's a couple things that we're going to want to do. We're going to want to make sure there's some place for him to hide, because we want to encourage him to be able to use this ability. And we're also going to try to find a way to flush him out of cover or go and get him when he's behind cover. Hayden, as we talked about, we made him a protection paladin, and we gave him... Uh, you know what? Actually, we're going to adjust his spells... We're going to remove one of the smites. Uh, protection from evil and good is the other thing we're going to grab. 
For Hayden, we know that he's going to want to be protecting his allies, but he's also got, like, a compelled duel. We want to make sure that we have people for him to fight and people for him to intercept, but this can't just be a one-on-one -on -one fight, or, or rather a four-on-one -on -one fight. We need more than just one boss monster. There's got to be some sort of minions or some sort of mooks uh, for us to deal with. Vilial has a robot. Vilial has a, what is it called? Steel Defender. Uh, which we haven't named, but it doesn't really matter for today's purposes. Um, but we have a, an extra character to deal with vis-a-vis -vis the Steel Defender. And then we've got Soroya. Each creature of your choice within 10 feet of you must succeed on a deck saving throw or take 2d4 force damage. So again, we want there to be a lot of things for her to face off with because she's really good at crowd control, which we've already kind of established is something we want to do. We also don't want to go overboard, right? I mean, we know the action economy means that if we have eight enemies that they're fighting, that could potentially go really lethal really quickly. So we kind of want to feel it out. I mean, unless they're really, really low level enemies, but because these are only third level characters, that's kind of a tough ask. So we're not at the point yet where, because of all the damage that, you know, even low level enemies can do, three, four hits from a low level enemy can still kill our monk or our bard. And honestly, five hits is going to take down Hayden. So I will say we want somewhere in the neighborhood of like five to six enemies to deal with. What kind of monster? And I'm just gonna take suggestions. We don't need to do a poll because I've got nothing and I've got nothing planned. What type of monster or monsters? Just one as an inspiration jumping off point. Do we want as actually you know what? Instead of doing that, because I think this is more useful if we go with something random. So let's do that. Okay, so we got four PCs third level encounter difficulty hard here we go this is the thing this is what i'm looking for a nilbog and six goblins you're voting for the yuanti yeah the problem with these yuanti options is that they don't give us very much to work with as far as the number of enemies we got the nilbog for cr1 tosh the city's laughter and any attempts to damage the Nilbog must succeed on a DC 12 charisma saving throw or be charmed and must use its action to praise the Nilbog. Oof. That's powerful. But that's interesting. And all the rest of them are just goblins. Okay. That's different than I was expecting, but I think that'll work. We're going to use the goblin, the goblins and the Nilbog. So. Let's pick a map. Desecrated Sylvan Sanctuary. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. The stumps of roots stretch to each wall, weaving through the stone floor like fabric. Cool. Okay, that's what we're looking for. That's cool. Uh, oh, jewelry blocks. It's not on the stat block, but Nilbogs also have the ability to possess other goblins when they die. What? Ah. Okay. If the host is killed or the possession is ended by... Ha! Huh. Cool. So we just picked a paladin as one of our characters. And I wasn't even thinking of this, but he has protection from evil and good. So we've now picked something that if the paladin thinks it through, he can use this this spell to force out the Nilbog um, host. Interesting. Okay, that's that makes this a very interesting fight. <sighs> but there's not really much cover here. But in theory, the guy could make his cover by... Yeah, he can lift up one of these doors. If the, if the bard wants cover, he can run over here, lift up one of the doors, or ask the paladin to do it, and take cover behind that. So there's something there. He could always take cover behind one of these roots as well. It would not be amazing cover, but there's one right here as well. And there's some crates back here. Okay, never mind. There's stuff, there's stuff for him to... Worst case scenario, he hides back here and shoots around the corner. He's got Eldritch Blast. That is a pretty good spell. Uh, Owlbear, you bring up an excellent point. It means if the party does not take care of the Nilbog spirit, they may have a recurring enemy. It does not apply here, but like in general. So maybe what they're doing is they're doing a ritual here, and the Nilbog is sort of the the manifestation. And it could be like an older Nilbog spirit, like an older goblin spirit. Six goblins and one Nilbog. 
And I think we can kind of imagine how well that's going to work out, right? So we know that the Bard is going to want to take cover behind here because he, he's got Eldritch Blast and he's got the Spell Sniper feat, uh, which is how he got Eldritch Blast. He can hide behind here or behind here and take pot shots at goblins, which means they're going to want to spread out, which means they're going to be limited to probably using their bow and arrow, which thankfully the monk can catch the bow, bow and arrow very easily, or run up to a, a goblin, use their, um, whatever it's called, arms of the astral self, and sort of detonate that area. Viliol Venikeen has spells, I assume. What do they have? Catapult. And we have a lot of things in the room they can use for catapult. Um, cure wounds to help keep people alive. We've got three characters, I think, in this party with cure wounds. So I'm not worried about them going down, right? Because Felix has cure wounds. And, well, okay, the Paladin, Hayden doesn't have Cure Wounds, but he's got Lay on Hands. And he's got Compelled Duel, so if he wants, he can try to target um, the Nilbog. He's got really good Wisdom. Felix is probably not going to be taking on the Nilbog, but the Paladin probably is. Vilio probably is not. Soroya has a chance. If Hayden can come up with the idea, he can use Protection from Evil and Good, which we did give him as a preparation, to... Um, cleanse the Nilbog spirit. Will he think of it? Well, maybe Felix the Fair will uh, use his pretty good... Well, he doesn't have amazing arcana. Never mind, Viliel has an amazing arcana. Maybe Viliel will come up with that idea, suggest it to uh, our player. If they don't, it's not a big deal. They can just keep fighting. In response to another creature dealing damage to the Nilbog, the Nilbog reduces the damage to zero and regains three hit points. So he can do that once per turn, because that's his reaction. So you really do need someone like either the Monk or the Paladin who's going to deal a lot of damage to them. But he can use Mocking Word to give them disadvantage. This is an interesting encounter. This is a cool encounter. And that's the other thing, too. Um, Owlbear, you bring up a good point. If there are context clues leading up to the encounter, you can hint that there's something going on. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to make this a magical effect as well. We're going to call this, what should the magical effect in the center be? It looks like a fairy ring. Because there's two options, right? There's either this is the ritual that they're performing, which it might be. And maybe it'll go away when all the goblins are dead. Ah, uh, I know what it is. Okay, Owlbear, you're suggesting time stuff, like either getting slowed or hasted when you step in and leave it up to chance. Here's what I think it is. I think when you enter this space, you're hasted. When you leave, you are slowed. However, as you leave, you're seeing the spirit of the Nilbog possessing different goblins over time. This is the summoning circle. This is how they brought this Nilbog spirit, and they've summoned this, this Nilbog spirit into one of them. So if you enter this space, if they can't figure out what the Nilbog is and why it's happening and any of that, if they go here and then they leave, they're slowed, but as they're slowed, they're being hit with these memories of this Nilbog spirit being summoned and all these other times that it's possessed other goblins. And so they realize this is a spirit. This is something inside. It's like a possession mechanic, basically. And they they see the moment when this goblin was summoned right before they got here that brought it into this goblin body. And so they know, okay, this is not ordinarily, you know, this isn't just a, a shaman or a priest of the goblins. I think that's what I would do with this space. It's another way for them to get the information they need in, for, in terms of how to defeat the Nilbog. And it's a buff if you're in this area. Um, you're obviously, you're hasted if you're in here for however long you're in here. But if you leave this space, you are slowed for one round. And maybe that's too powerful. Maybe you're only hasted for one round. But haste only lasts if you're in this area. And this is a very vulnerable area. There's not a lot of cover here. Right, Albert. that's what I'm thinking, is the, the what's causing the slow is these flashbacks overwhelming you. And sort of seeing all of these things is like what's distracting you and, and slowing you down. I think that's really cool. Does it apply to enemies as well? Yeah, absolutely it applies to enemies as well. Uh, anyone who goes in there, it's indiscriminate. It doesn't know the difference. It doesn't care. Yeah, I think that's the encounter. And so that's basically how you can go about designing an encounter. But what we're going to do is we're gonna level everything up. I wanna jump in here and thank Describe for sponsoring this video. 
Describe has an awesome team of writers who put together pre-written text that you can use for your games. As you've seen in this video, they also have incredible maps that have specific rooms linked to awesome descriptions. So you can do exactly what I did in the video and take these maps and run them in your games. And Describe is offering a discount to viewers of this channel. If you visit Describe.com supergeek and use the promo code supergeek at checkout, you could save 10% off of your first subscription payment. Once again, that's dscryb.com slash supergeek and use the promo code supergeek. Thank you again to Describe for sponsoring this video. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna level up our characters because that's part of the process, right? Let's say that this was the encounter you were given, but now you're like, okay, but I don't have level three characters. I have level five characters. How can I make adjustments? All right, let's look at these character sheets. I don't think anything major has changed. We still kind of know how they play, right? Felix the Fair is still going to be trying to do his Eldritch Blast from behind cover. Um, Hayden Winter is still going to try to be protecting his allies. It's, now he has a horse, which does change his mobility quite a bit. Vilial can now cast Heat Metal, so we might want to put someone in some armor that she can do that to. And Soroya, Stunning Strike, oh good. Oh, Extra Attack, that's what she has. Extra Attack as well. Hayden got extra attack. Oh man, we're dealing with some powerful foes here. And he regains inspiration on a short and long rest. He's got cutting words. This is getting a more powerful party. All right, let's see. We want to upgrade these guys to be more formidable. We're going to keep the cave as is. I think that still makes sense. But we're going to change the goblins to um, the level are hobgoblins. CR4, CR3, CR6. Those might be a little bit strong. Iron Shadows, okay. So let's let's figure out what our math should be. What should we be working with? We upgrade them to five. Devastator is CR4. So we'll swap that out for the Orc Blade of Interval. And then the other Hobgoblins are what, one half? Yeah, so we can basically just use this one. We're basically using the Orc Blade of Interval, but instead of that, we're doing the Hob Goblin Devastator and four Hobgoblins. And we're just gonna steal the um, gimmick of the Nilbog and say that anytime the Devastator dies, he ports into another uh, Hobgoblin's um, body. And he's got some powerful spells. Fireball, Fly, Fog Cloud, Gust of Wind, and Lightning Bolt. Um, which is pretty cool. Now, we don't have to do that, but I think that's fun. I mean, it only makes it what? It makes it slightly more power more dangerous, for sure. So we don't have the... You have to roll the... Whatever it's called. The Charisma Saving Throw in order to attack this thing, or you'll be charmed. That's a powerful ability. Then we have Mocking Word, and we're not using that either. <clears throat> so instead we've got these spells. Where is he? Right there. I would try it. I mean, the worst case scenario, the worst thing that happens. And I think what you would do is you would still maintain, okay, even though it's passed into a new Hobgoblin, it still has the same limitations. It can still only cast these two for day each. Because we're basically just increasing this thing's hit points, but every time they go down, you're just clearing another Hobgoblin off the board. Um, which is, I think, going to have a cool effect. So that's how I would do that. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And you still have the same effect here of if you're in this space, you're hasted. When you leave, you can understand, oh, this is the hobgoblin version of a Nilbog. It's basically possessed by this, like, storm spirit. And um, you've got to kill the Nilbog, the, the Devastator. Um, or can you purge it with the... Um, protection from evil and good. I think that's a cool encounter, and I think that's a smart way to increase the difficulty um, while still keeping the theming uh, very much the same. I mean, you could also just, like, take the Nilbog and the Goblins and raise their hit points or add more Goblins, and that's a different approach to making the encounter more challenging. I just think making it Hobgoblins kind of also works well with the increase in the kinds of monsters you fight. You know, you don't want to just still be fighting goblins when you're level 5, because you've probably been fighting a fair number of goblins at that point. This becomes a much more sinister thing in the center here, 
when you're dealing with hobgoblins than with the cutesy fae. Um, and I, again, we've linked... Um, this is very fae um, in tone. And linking the goblins and the hobgoblins to fae is very much a part of this, right? Like, it says so right here. Mm, no. Here. Hobgoblins of the Feywild. They first appeared in the Feywild millennia ago, and they resided there until they spread out from there. This is a archfey, or this is like a spirit of an archfey, or a spirit of a unseelie. That's the word I'm looking for. An unseelie fey who has been brought into this goblin to possess them. This is like a goblin cult, a hobgoblin cult of the Feywild, and a goblin cult of the Feywild. That's very interesting, because we don't really see that in, in, in either goblins or hobgoblins, but if we recharacterize the Nilbog, which is already Fey, but to sort of, like, instead of being, oh, this is a trickster deity, you can say it's a deity, or you could just say that it's a Fey spirit, because I think that works. And I think if we say, like, these are cults that are devoted to the Feywild, maybe the Feywild is a bigger part of this campaign than it is in in most others. Um, they're not just worshipping Magubliet. They're not just trying to kill people to kill them. This is a fey cult. That's kind of cool. I really like that. Then we get this interesting question of, like, are they the ones who constructed this? Was this already here? You know, what is this space that we're in? Sight of a sylvan ritual. That works perfectly with what we're describing. A bright light, silver, blue, and white, like the face of the moon, blooms at the center of this vast chamber, and green motes flicker like fireflies all around the room, tinkling like small bells as they waft by. Seven bedrolls create a semicircle. Seven, we have what? How many, um... Six goblins and one possessed by the goblin. That works perfectly. Um, we would just say... We would just hand wave away two of them for the goblin, for the hobgoblin example. But seven bedrolls works perfectly. Ah, that worked out so well. Seven bedrolls create a semicircle around the light, and two chests sit against the northern wall. A tree stump in the center of the ethereal illumination is attended by a flock of floating spores. Oh, these spores are floating! I didn't even realize that. So yeah, really glad that we gave that some um, supernatural vibe. I mean, it obviously has supernatural vibe on the map, but yeah, I think that works really well. The tree stump in the center of the ethereal illumination is attended by a flock of floating spores, each one a puffball of white, indented with a single dark spot, giving them an uncanny resemblance to eyes. The stump's roots stretch to each wall, weaving through the stone floor like thread through fabric. The source of the searing silvery white lunar light appears to be the words written on the ground around the stump, encircling it. The graceful flowing script thrums with magic. So, if they destroy the script on the wall, on the floor... Would that... I don't think that would get rid of the Nilbog, but I think that would trap the Nilbog in whatever body it's in. That's what I would say. But it would also, for sure, end the effects in that area. Kameener, you say, I think there's real... I think there's a really compelling narrative also implied by the fact that the room is obviously man-made, but the stump appears to have grown and been felled long after the construction of the space. Yeah, so actually, this is what I was going to do, is I was going to go look at... What are the other descriptions... One large tree root weaves into this chamber, its sinewy tendrils streaming, seemingly reaching towards the cluster of beds. Yeah. Um, yeah, that gives that room a lot of personality. Tiny lime green wisps bob above the dark water. You could easily add some will-o'-the-wisps during this encounter as well. Not during the main encounter, but throughout like the dungeon. They re disappear and reappear. When approached, they wink out of existence for a moment before reappearing with an audible shimmer elsewhere in the disturbance. The light they conjure does not offer the warmth of the glowing braziers nearby. Instead, the air around them is a chill curtain. Maybe you even treat them like yellow mold stats. Oh, and then here, that's cool. Directly to the north of the water, tall wooden cabinets block anything beyond. They are placed haphazardly as if dragged in haste as a kind of bulwark. A slow burble comes from the pool. Bubbles emerge from the depths. So we put something in the water as well. I don't know what, because we're not doing this entire area, but... Clearly, like, these roots were coming in, people ran from this room, barricaded it with the, um, with the cabinets, and fled. I'm not gonna do this entire map, because, like, you should, you know, go and download it if you're interested in it. But, like, in the chapel, there's brown roots coming in from all four of the walls. Sudden cold washes over the area, in tandem with a sound like a ragged sigh. Uh, 
directly to the left of the entrance beyond one of the reaching roots a stone coffin begins to stir with a low grating sound okay so yeah so this is very much like do we want to have that ghast and ghoul encounter that we talked about earlier throw a ghoul in here yeah i think that this worked out really well i think that would be a very cool encounter Albert, you said that description makes me think that the reason either goblins or hobgoblins are there is to have more of them be possessed with an eye like spores and all that yeah yeah maybe this is just the first one to get possessed and um they all want to get possessed by these spirits. That's a cool map, and I think that works really well with what we've we've mapped out. Cool. All right. And that's the video. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope this video was helpful. If you like this video, please subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about when I upload new videos. You can also join me on Discord. We have a really awesome community there. And you can stay up to date with all of my latest updates by signing up for my newsletter. And of course, as I discussed earlier, you can support me on Patreon and follow me on Twitch. All of those links are in the doobly-doo below. When you're designing your own encounters and running your own combats, you might want to take some time to think about when you want to call for a role in your games, and I made a whole other video about that. You should check that out right here. Until next time, play fair and have fun.